Let's go back to food and beverages companies. What do you think are the biggest challenges right now for those companies uh, uh, midway to 2020, planning for a summer, which it's going to be probably uh, commercially not very sound with a very high risk uh, of uh, uh, unpaid invoices, by the way, uh, because especially with the away of home channel, uh, there is a bit of, uh, you know, there is two scenarios conflicting, one of mass extinction, the other one of uh, survival of the fittest. So what do they need and what's their biggest challenge moving forward in the next six to nine months? So you've, uh, I think you've uh, already <clears throat> touched on a very interesting point, and it's, um, it really it depends on the mix of the channel that some of these companies have. So obviously, the more out of home that you have, the more you have suffered because mm -hmm. your clients have been closed for three, four months, and you don't quite know who's going to pay, who's going to open up over the next few months. So I think that the biggest challenge is really readapting your offer, and that could be through obviously the channel. So a big shift towards the online needs to happen in all ways, uh, whether it's with your existing uh, current partners that have their own online shops, whether it's setting up on your own something online and also formats. I think this will have, you know, the, the, the trends that we discussed and this shift is going to make companies work on their formats to really assess what their offering is in in those channels and again adapt fast decision making you can't you know do something uh too late mm -hmm. because if you do the chances are you're going to get it wrong and you're going to be you know penalized by it no i agree and by the way if i may add uh, the future scenarios are uncertain you can't bet on one possible future. You need to keep open several parallel several bets. Parts. Uh, and, and then, uh, uh, you know, if you are late, uh, you know, the whole concept uh, goes down the drain. And then uh, uh, the risk is very high that you're actually not even going to be able to bet on time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, uh, a lot of these companies, a lot of companies, um, have strong supply chains or had them. Um, we've seen some onshoring and shifting on these supply chains. They've been under a, a great stress. Huh? Um, so, you know, we're not sure what, uh, what, what do you think they need to do going forward, companies to, to be builders resilient chains? Well, I think that uh, uh, this is a great question. The, the, the concept, the notion of resilience has always been uh, intended or declined in the past 20 years as a uh, cost resilient <laughs> in terms of uh, how cost effective uh, would be. So uh, seeking uh, uh, economies of scale, uh, seeking uh, uh, um, to really uh, reduce volatility uh, of the cost base uh, from, uh, from a certain point of view. The byproduct of that uh, is that a lot of these productions will happen uh, in one country, two country, and not uh, a very close country. This is less true for, for food and beverages in general, but it is true for other consumer goods companies, for consumer electronics, for automotive parts. So what happens is that uh, uh, in the post-COVID world, where borders close and uh, supply, global supply chain gets disrupted, uh, some industries stopped because they didn't have the parts and they only had one component or one raw material which would be sourced from one country. So moving forward for the future, resilience will need to be declined in terms of agility. Okay. We need more agile supply chain, and we need uh, a notion of risk embedded in the supply chain itself, which means, first and foremost, uh, don't trade off all the cost, uh, but keep alternatives open, keep multiple suppliers from multiple countries 
open, even if the cost uh, it's more volatile, but at least making sure that uh, if in the interim reality or in the new reality, we are going to have similar pandemic uh, events uh, from an economic point of view, of course, I'm, I'm talking about, then uh, you have the ability to keep uh, sourcing and keep producing. Uh, slightly higher cost, uh, but with less risk because a lower cost, a lower cost per unit product, which at a certain point you can't import in your manufacturing uh, operation, it's actually a bigger cost overall uh, than a per unit cost, which is slightly higher, but you can always source at any point in time. So we need to uh, integrate, disintermediate this notion of low cost with a, uh, with a notion of an variable of risk management so that uh, we don't trade one for the other, but we keep uh, uh, overall uh, you know, our cost base under control, but in a riskless or less riskless, less risky situation. Mm.